everyone, this is DJ Ravine here for Point Blank Music School and I'm here today with Rinzen from LA and signed to Mousetrap Records. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. It's my second time in London. I'm excited to be back here. Check out Point Blank for the first time. Oh, we're happy to have you here. What brings you to London this time, anyway? Uh, so I'm playing Creamfields this weekend and then in the meantime, we're doing a mousetrap party at uh, Village Underground in London tonight. Cool. And uh, today, what are we looking at? So I thought it would be cool to show one of my recent original tracks. It's a song called Taurus, which is a collaboration with two other artists. Um, one of them is Marbs and the other is Evan Casey. These two are artists um, who are pretty big in the California scene over where I'm from, and they're part of this Desert Hearts movement, which is this music festival turned record label. And the three of us made an EP together, and this is the lead single from that EP. What kind yeah. of style would you say your music is? So I think my music sits somewhere between house and techno, but on the more melodic and cinematic spectrum. Mm. So sometimes it does have a more darker kind of techno foundation but it usually has the more groove and kind of emotional part of house music. So it's hard to pin it down specifically, but it's somewhere along that spectrum. All right, well, let's, uh, let's have a listen to the track first. Sure. I've noticed you got a really cool little mouse there. Yeah, I do so much computer work that at some point I was starting to have some like wrist and finger pain just from so much typing and mouse work. So I found this like really small ergonomic mouse, which looks kind of ridiculous, but uh, it's actually way more comfortable because it's more of like a pen or pencil grip than the traditional like mouse claw. I personally love it. It just for me makes producing like a lot easier and faster. Dude, that's so weird. It takes some getting used to, but I love it. All right, sweet. So where should we start? I thought it'd be cool to start kind of with how I typically start writing the tracks. And for me, that usually involves building a groove and then writing some melodies and chords on top of it. And so with this track, you'll see in my session, uh, the way it's laid out, I have all the drums right at the top. It's everything in orange over here when you see the channels. And that for me allows me to compartmentalize it in my mind. I know these are all the drum sounds. I can like group them together and I can like, view them all together and then decide which layers I need at a certain time. And so when I'm breaking down the layers in this track, uh, we tried to opt for hat and hi-hat sounds that sounded a little bit more acoustic and real sounding. Just sometimes I find those cut through a bit better in a mix when it's got a little bit more metallic or like a sharper edge to it. And of course, you just have to be a little bit careful with the high end and making sure it's not bothering your ears or becoming cumbersome. So if I just play the drum bus here, you can hear all the drums. So it's not actually too complicated. I believe you should kind of build a good drum groove, but leave enough space in it that you still have enough room for other sounds like the bass and your lead synths and your pads to also have room. Uh, if the drums are just taking up the entire mix, then there's no room for any other sounds and you find yourself just really quickly crowding the entire mix down and then nothing is loud. Do you have any particular processing tricks you use to get those drums sound the way they are? I do, yeah. So um, there's two plugins, both from Sound Toys, uh, that I really love to put on my drums. And the first is called CQ, and it's kind of this analog uh, EQ emulator. I always use it to add a bit of high end to my drums, but even sometimes just to the overall mix. And so you can see here, I have this hi-hat called Real Hat, if I just solo it. 
So again, it kind of sounds like a real acoustic hi-hat that's like opening and closing. And then what I've done is put CQ on it. And if you can see, the high is turned up by 9 dB. If I take it off now, it's a lot more dull. So by adding this CQ, it really kind of comes to life. Gives it like a shimmer. Yeah. And so that's usually the uh, one step of the drums I'll do. Um, of course, I'll always EQ my drums, like this hat, for instance, because it has that more acoustic sound, had a lot of low end to it. So I ended up shelving off a good bit, which you can see. And then um, there's a small little subtractive dip too, around like 11K, which again was for a little bit of the higher end, high end or tinniness, partially because I was boosting it with CQ. So then another thing I'll do is uh, once I have all the drums together, I put them in a bus. So I have this hat bus right here, you can see. And what I'm doing with this bus is one, adding a little bit of stereo image with uh, this pl uh, plugin called Center Stereo from Waves. And then also boosting the transients a little bit with this transient shaper. It's just a free one that I found online. And this is just making it so that initial spike of audio just cuts through a little bit harder. And then what I've also done is thrown a linear multiband compressor on it. And this is just to catch any certain peaks, whereas like some sections of the track may have all the drums going at once. So there could be frequency buildup in just a specific band of frequencies. So by using the multiband compressor here, I'm able just to capture just those moments when things are getting a little bit more chaotic and tame them a little bit. Uh, and then I go one step further is that once I have that like hat, dr or hat bus of my drums, I'll send it to like an entire drum bus that also has the claps and often the kick. And on that one uh, is when I do a little bit more processing. Um, in this case, I've done some glue compression, which is again to kind of catch peaks in volume and make it a little bit more consistent over time so that there's not these big volume spikes when all the drums are happening. And then I've also done a little bit more transient shaping here, in this case with a plugin called Elevate from Newfangled Audio. And this has a really nice transient shaper that I like applying to my drum buses, just as a way to kind of glue everything together a bit more and also just make things a little bit tighter. And yeah, that's kind of my process for my drums. Uh, it obviously varies track per track, but that's what I've done in this case. Cool, and then from here you would go and write chords? Yeah, so first uh, I would look to add like a bass line to this and then I would put chords on top of that. Um, but just to really quickly show you what we've done with the bass, it's pretty simple in this track. It's just like an eighth note bass, and it's just playing the root chord uh, for the most part, which in this case is a C sharp. And so if I add that bass now with the drums, So as you can see, it's pretty simple, just like a pumping eighth note bass line. And this was recorded from my Moog Sub 37. That's typically what I reach for when I'm looking for bass sounds. It tends to be a really rich, thick sound that I think is incredible for low end. And as long as you kind of process it right, it doesn't eat up too much room in the mix. Uh, so just to quickly show you some of the processing I've done on here is I recorded it straight into Ableton. I'm rolling off a little bit of the low end. In this case, I don't need anything below 30 Hertz. It's kind of like that dead subspace that you don't really hear or need. I like adding a little bit of chorus to anything that I record from the Moog because it comes in mono. Chorus gives it a little bit of stereo image. Uh, in this case, it's just at 12%. So it's a little subtle, but just opens up the bass a little bit. Uh, I got an auto filter from Ableton, and that's just kind of rising over time as the track progresses. The bass line is just getting more high frequencies and kind of getting bigger in the mix. And then at parts where I want to bring it down, uh, like bring the track energy down, I'll bring that cut off on the auto filter back down. Um, Decapitator is one plugin that I'm always putting on my synths and also my drums. In this case, you can see the drive is turned up pretty heavy. And this is just adding uh, a lot of saturation and minor bits of distortion to the bass. And that helps it to kind of cut through more in the mix and also to achieve a bit more loudness without actually eating up more headroom. And one thing that I really like doing with Decapitator is to run the drive pretty high and then take this low cut knob and then start to whittle away at the low end. And what you're basically doing is like saturating it thickening the mid range and the high end. And then also to compensate, removing a little bit of low ends just so it ends up not taking up as much headroom. 
you get more character out of it as well. Because, so much more. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see why you do it because once you low cut it, yeah. well, the lows probably was going to sound very similar. Even yeah. the high low is yeah. still going to sound very similar, but you get yeah. more character out of the mids and exactly. highs. Exactly. And the thing is, I think you don't actually need as much low end once you really start to thicken up the mid range and you can hear the bass. Often, like when we're turning up our sub bass or like our mid range bass, it's because we want to hear uh, just the bass more in general because there might not be much high end to it. But by using something like Decapitator or Saturator or some other distortion plugin, you can kind of achieve that presence that you're looking for without adding too much more loudness to it. Last thing I have on here that's pretty it's helpful. There's a lot of plugins on this. Yeah, this isn't even that much for some of my chains. I have a dynamic EQ on here, and this is just catching some of the low end. And when it's peaking at certain sub frequencies, it's just kind of bringing it down a bit, just again to make the bass more consistent over time. Um, I'm a big fan of using yeah compression limiting or multiband compression as just ways to kind of smooth out volume over time. And I think if you do that on all of your sounds, you just end up having all this more headroom at the end because nothing is really peaking when it shouldn't be. Nothing is really so inconsistent that it's eating up everything else. Pretty much everything yeah. here is audio, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I typically only work in audio. Um, at this point, I'm really just using analog synths for my sounds. Uh, if I do use a soft synth, I'm, pr I'm pretty quickly bouncing it. The only thing that is more MIDI is I typically use drum racks from Ableton for all my drum sounds. And I just like the flexibility that provides. Mm by dropping something into a drum rack, for instance, if I go to like these white noise hits, uh, it's really nice because you basically get a mini sampler for each hit. So like if I solo these white noise drum hits, you can see that uh, down here in the envelope of it, I'm able to control the envelope and change it over time. So like with one of these white hats. It's good for like a build up. Yeah, I'm able to modulate the decay or the attack, the sustain over time, and you can just have these drum sounds that are changing, but even though it's still the same bass sound. Once I have the groove, then I'll tend to look for more melodic stuff to write over it. So in this case, we had some chord progressions that we kind of started to layer on top of it, and then some weird hard sync sounds that also got thrown in the mix. So if I just go to one of these chord pads right here, So what you're hearing there is this chord pad. And basically what that is, is this synth patch from the Prophet Rev 2, which is another synth I have in my studio. And it's just playing some dyads, which is just like a two voice chord. So you've got the root note, and then I believe it's playing the seventh and the fifth here, or maybe the sixth and the fifth. And together you get this larger chord texture but it's still only two voices to it, so it's still a little bit more simple. It's a nice way to add some harmony and some movement without having to overcrowd it with like too many voices in a chord. And so I like to record that out and then process it pretty heavily within the DAW. I've got, again, some Sound Toys plugins. Crystallizer, I think, is maybe like one of the most underrated Sound Toys plugins. For me, it just adds this element of unexpectedness to a sound where you can kind of create something that has a little bit of a mind of its own. In this case, it's kind of like delaying the sound, but also like reversing it at the same time and doing some granular echo to it. Is, is it like grain delay? In yeah, Ableton? a little bit. Again, it's so hard for me to classify, yeah. but it's one of those plugins that I reach for whenever I just want to make something a little bit more twisted. And so I've got Crystallizer first, and then I'm running that into Decapitator, which is just bringing out more mid-range. I've got that running into a ping pong delay, and that's just to increase the tail of the sound and give it more stereo image. That's then running into Black Hole, which is probably my favorite reverb. It's this massive kind of cavernous reverb that I love putting on pad sounds or melody sounds. After that, I've got CQ, which is the EQ from Sound Toys, and that's adding more high end. The sound already has a decent amount of high end. There's like a white noise that comes out of the filter, or the CQ in this case is really just boosting the high end even more and making it much more prominent. 
So you use yeah. that mostly for um, additive EQ, right? Yeah. Just because yeah. it's like an analog model and it probably exactly. makes it sound a lot better than just EQ8. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I like. There's a little bit of character to it, so it's great as the additive EQ. And then for my more subtractive EQs, I'm always using FabFilter Pro Q2, or if I need to save CPU, just um, EQ8. But you can see on this one, yeah, I'm rolling off the low end primarily and then giving a little bit of like a mid shelf boost just around like one to 2K. And that's again, just for some more presence on that sound. So if I were to AB this chain, I'll just take everything off first. I'm getting like a very like interstellar kind of aliens yeah. vibe out yeah. of it. The three of us are big sci-fi fans yeah. for sure. And we always yeah. channel a little bit of, yeah, like Interstellar. Or we're all fans of the, the movie's Arrival. But so you might have noticed on that sound, the tail of the pad ends a little bit abruptly and the next one begins. So I, what we wanted to do was kind of make it bleed into itself and have this, you know, kind of spectral trail to it. So this uh, processing chain is one part, an attempt to, to merge the two parts of the pad together. droning out of that as well when you've got that plug in that makes sense. you do yeah i think that's a lot from crystallizer and then the ping pong and like black hole mm. reverb that's like a pretty common combination that i'll use just to give things this weird tail to them and extend their release essentially we did some interesting things with these synth hits which are from the moog sub 37 so what we basically did is record a various like runs of hard sync melodies we're basically playing these little uh, melodic trills and jumping between octaves, all with a hard sync on, which is putting it up like a seventh. And so you get this really interesting texture to them that sounds a little bit alien as well. And we thought matched well with everything else. Um, and then we've gone ahead and processed them as well, just to make them even weirder and a bit more cinematic. If I open uh, one of them up, you can see we just record so many different hits and then once it comes time to arrange, we kind of search through and find like our favorite ones and then kind of arrange them in a pattern that sounds interesting. Mm. For me, it's a little bit more of an untraditional way to write a melody. Typically I might write a bass and some chords and then just write a melody over it. And then, you know, you have the MIDI, you can run it into a synth or you can have a soft synth. But this is a way to kind of come up with melodies that maybe you wouldn't have thought of initially. So again, what we did is really just jam on the Moog and play out these different melodies and sequences. And then we had this long string of them and pieced them together in a sequence that made sense logically to us. So if I play them now, it sounds like. It's got a cool little progression. Yeah, and again, so the interesting thing is we didn't write them in that sequence. We found these different hits that we'd recorded and then lined them up and made a sequence out of it. It was a way to write something that we normally would never have come up with. And I think, again, with the hard sync, you get this really weird kind of resonant quality to the high end that sounds so unique. And that was what really drew us to it in this case. And just to show you some of the processing, again, we've got crystallizer on. And that's to add that weird granular tail to it. And when you combine crystallizer and ping pong, it's nice because you get that kind of granulation, but it gets delayed and goes stereo and you get kind of like a, a longer tail to it. It's a similar chain to what we had on the pads. It's yeah, the crystallizer and the decapitator into ping pong into that black hole reverb into again, adding some high end with CQ. And then I've got a glue compressor to catch some of the peaks when it gets a little bit too loud and then just the EQ and a side chain at the end. Those were kind of the core melodic sounds, but then arrangement wise, we really wanted to have some big moments to the track, some kind of more dramatic moments that would be a bigger moment on a dance floor. And so for us, that came down to creating this acidy baseline that we could layer on top of our original baseline. And this again was created with the sub 37. So if I just solo that, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. 
then we actually opted to create a progression out of it. Most of the track is written just with the root note going the entire time. And that typically is common for genres like techno, where maybe it just sticks to that one root note for the whole track. It makes it very mixable. And so I'd say for three fourths of this track, it is kind of following that formula. But then we wanted to change it up for the very last drop and add a bigger progression to it, something that would lift the energy up even higher. And so this acidy baseline hits, and then it will actually kind of begin a new progression. And if I play that in context with the buildup, you can really hear it. So it was a way for us to spice up the arrangement and create this new unexpected turn to the song. And so we had the Moog Sub 37, the original bass line, also following the progression. It gives a bit of like a progressive feel to it. That moving melodic bass line is definitely something you would hear more in a progressive track. But I really enjoy throwing that into something that leans a little bit more in the techno direction, I think then you can get some really interesting kind of harmony going, some interesting movement. So if I open up that acid bass line, a lot of the sound is coming from Ableton's built-in chorus. Again, one of the, my favorite things to put on an analog recording, specifically if it's a mono recording, if I'm turning that on and off here. That's with the chorus, if I take it off, In isolation, it might sound fatter because the signal is all stacked in the middle, but what the chorus is doing is really opening up the stereo image. And when you have that in headphones, it just sounds really nice. And from a mixing perspective, it's a really good way to move things to the side because often I find when you've got all your low end content, all your mid range stuff right in the middle, they're really competing for space. So any chance I have to kind of move things to the side or open up their stereo image, is I think a wonderful opportunity to make more room for the sub bass, make more room for the kick. And I typically find as long as your kick is dead center, your sub is dead center in mono, everything else you have a lot more flexibility with and can really open up. So again, a lot of that sound is coming from the chorus. And then this is a nice trick that I like to do within Ableton. I'm sure you can do it within other DAWs as well. But basically I like to create an audio effect rack around a single specific effect. In this case, it's reverb. What I'm basically doing is duplicating the channel within it. So I have a dry signal and a wet signal. It's kind of like doing a send and return, but on an individual channel. And in this case, I'm doing it with the black hole reverb. And it's a way for me to have this reverb wet channel and this dry non reverb channel. And then I can EQ and kind of change the volume of the reverb specifically. The reason for doing that is because often with these bigger reverbs, they come with a lot of low end that I don't want on my channel. And of course you could just EQ after the reverb, but then you'd be taking away some of the original sound too. And so by doing it with this audio effect track internally, I'm able to just to roll off the low end and a bit of the high end of the reverb, but not touch any of the low end of the original sub 37 sound. <laughs> So you can hear it a bit, there's that reverb tail to it, but it's nicely EQ'd, so it's not competing and fighting for space in the mix or taking up space from other things in the mix. Do you do a little mid-side kind of stuff? I do, yeah. Mid-side EQ is kind of one of my favorite mixing tools as well. I think it's a really good way to control your st stereo image a little bit more precisely. What I'm often doing, for instance, is rolling off the side on parts that don't typically need it or need as much. So the main bass line, for instance, you don't really need any side content on it under like 200 Hertz, or under 150 Hertz, just because 
it's all low end and you typically want that dead center, you know, providing that weight of the track. And I find that when you start to have build up under like 150 or 175 hertz on the sides, it can just make your whole mix start to get really muddy. So even when it comes to the final mix or final master, I'm typically rolling off the side end around 150 to 175, just like you can see here on this bass. Also, it's a nice way, like if you just wanted to add some stereo image to a sound, you can boost just the side by a few dB. And that's something I'll do as well, just to very precisely give some stereo image to a sound just within a certain frequency band. Uh, one last thing I'll show you that I like to do on my tracks is add a little bit of Foley sounds. And this is a way I think to add some interesting texture to a track. And it could be anything. It could be like the sound of paper being like scrunched up or tree bark, or it could be footsteps. But there's this whole world of like raw and found sounds that I think is a bit unexplored and has all this potential to it. I think you get a little bit of randomness when you start mm. to work with Foley, as well as some interesting textures. I've even recorded sounds just on my iPhone when I'm traveling, and then I've brought them back into the studio. And then, I mean, you process them so much that you, they sound crazy and they sound like something you wouldn't have generated with a Sopsin. So what I've done in this track is taken some sounds of paper and then have dropped it down an entire octave. So if I bump it up an octave first, this is what it, the original sound is. It's a little bit quiet, so I'm going to turn it up. So it's just paper. It's going through ping pong delay and some reverb here, and that's why it has that tail to it. Kind of sounds like some fries and chips. Yep, I hear that. <laughs> and then, yeah, what I like to do with these Foley samples is just experiment with different octaves. Like you could bump this up an octave. What I like doing is transposing things with warp off because it ends up, you know, lengthening the sample or shortening it as well as affecting the pitch of it. You end up getting much more kind of interesting combinations. And it comes down to that last kind of 5%, which is just like the ear candy and kind of polishing up a track. Awesome. Well, uh, we have a Moog sub fatty here. You reckon yeah. you could remake one of those sounds with that? Yeah, I'm down to give it a try. All right, cool. Yeah. So we go. I designed the initial sound on the Sub 37. This is the little brother, the Sub Fatty. And it's basically the same engine minus a few parts. But I think you can achieve a pretty close sound. So I'm going to try to recreate the acid bass from Taurus. And the main root of the sound is coming from a long glide, as well as a pretty high resonance. And that's giving it that weird acidiness, as well as the gliding between notes. So first thing is dialing in the envelope and basically has a long decay and a high sustain. A little less sustain. So now that envelope is sounding a little bit better I want the cutoff to be a little bit higher. Cool, that's sounding a bit better. And then I'm going to turn up the resonance, and that's going to give that acid sound to it. Cool. And then the next thing is adding a bunch of glide. So I get that long pitch bend between notes. So if I take it up an octave now and take the glide up a bit higher. Getting closer to the sound now. Give it a sub oscillator two as well, just to add a bit more weight to it. Yeah, and so that's probably the basis of it. And once I have that, I would record that into Ableton, add a bit of chorus, add a bit of saturation, 
or distortion, maybe a bit of reverb, and then that would be the basis for the lead sound. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming in and showing us your track, Taurus. What's happening in the world of Rins in the near future? Well, I just started working with some new record labels. One of those is Desert Hearts Records and Desert Hearts Black specifically, their techno sub-label. That's the label what, that we've signed Taurus with and released it with. So we're going to be playing a lot of shows stateside. Uh, beyond that, I'm starting to book a few more gigs like internationally. And in the meantime, I've just been finishing up a bunch of original material, getting some EPs together. Awesome, awesome. Well, we look forward to hearing more about from you soon. But anyways, thank you as usual for watching Point Blank Music School. As usual, check out pointblankmusicschool.com if you want to learn anything about music production. We've got it all here. And uh, make sure you like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. And we'll see you guys next time.